This will be a tutorial on how to do differential analysis of count data in genomics. So these days when you're sequencing, um, you know, for various assays like RNA seq will be one example to keep in mind today. But uh, what I'll talk about is sort of relevant for generally answering the question of, I counted a bunch of reads for some purpose in condition A and I did it in condition B. And I'd like to know what are the significant differential genes. And really, these days, a lot of experiments have more complicated designs. So if I had 45 hours, I would talk about a lot of other kinds of settings. But for today, we'll talk about the simple design uh, with two conditions. And the organizers asked us to keep these tutorials at an elementary level. So I'm going to try to do that. Most of what I'll do is fairly elementary basic stuff but I'll try to teach you hopefully a couple of the key points that you should be aware of when doing this kind of analysis. Now, I'd just like to quickly thank the people who I learned the subject from, mostly my former students and colleagues, um, primarily Harold Pimentel, who's my former student, he's now at Stanford, and um, uh, some of the little tips and anecdotes and things I'll tell you, really most of them come from them. So, what differential analysis is, it's kind of like this game you may have played as a kid, um, where you have to tell things apart. You know, you did some experiment, and I, I put a microscope and a sequencer because you do something in the lab usually. Um, there's dice because the kinds of experiments that produce reads are inherently random. They're random because biology itself is random, or stochastic, and they're random because the procedures by which the data are collected have randomness in them. And you get out sort of something like this, where for some transcripts or genes, you got some levels in two conditions. But there are error bars because, hopefully, you did some replicates. So you could measure the variation. And the question for today is really basic. It's kind of like this game you played as a kid where you, know, you have two pictures and you need to tell them apart, uh, like what's different. It's just the statistical version. Because you can all see this red bar is higher. But that's not good enough here. You have to understand, is it higher in the context of the variability of the experiment? All right? And so you really need to ask the question, is this significantly higher given the error bars that come from the variation in the experiment? Now, one thing I'll not talk about today is the actual experiment. Um, you also, as a biologist, need to play the same game with the actual experiment, right? You need to ask yourself, did I do something different when I did condition A versus condition B? That's called batch effect. And so um, you can look at this and try to figure out what's different between these two. It's pretty hard, kind of like it is to figure out batch effect in experiments. All right. So quick outline. I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through the very steps. Now, I'm going to do it in reverse order because I think it's pedagogically easier that way. Um, usually, you would design an experiment, you would align or pseudo-align the reads, I talked about this on Monday, then you would count somehow, then you model your counts, uh, you have to estimate things like the mean and the variance of your counts, you have to perform some statistical tests, and finally you get p-values and you do this thing called multiple testing correction. So I'm going to go in reverse order partly because I think it's easier uh, to start with the end result, um, how many people of you have done a, an analysis with reads where they've compared two conditions or experiments? Some people, right? Oh, quite a lot of people. Uh, some even did it to music. Um, <laughs> so you all know that what comes out of this are like p values or q values, and, and that's a baseline we can all start with. The experiments are all different, but what comes out at the end of one of these analyses is all the same. So I think it's easier to go that way. Um, and we're going to, given that some of you have done this, you know, um, maybe this will be easy, but because of this tutorial, you're actually going to do homework here. Now, this is great for me because the organizers, not me, have forbidden you from using laptops or phones. But they did not rule out paper and pencil. Okay, so you can use that. So um, I'm going to give you exercises that we're going to do as we go through the tutorial. You can do them by table. Um, uh, you know, if you want help from your friends, you can do that. Hopefully, they're all very easy. I think there should be, you know, these are kind of exercises you should maybe learn as an undergraduate in a stats course or a compiler course. Um, 
unless maybe you're from MIT, then it's more like graduate level, but I think otherwise it should be okay. All right. So our very first question will be about multiple hypothesis testing. How many people have done an analysis somewhere where they did a correction for multiple testing? Everyone. Okay, so this is easy. I'd like you to take a pencil and paper and take these 10 p-values and tell me which of them are significant after the benjamini hochberg correction with, a P, uh, with an FDR of 0.05. Easy, right? You've done this. All of you have done it, right? All right. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. If you really know what you're doing, you should be able to do this in your head. Who knows the answer? Nobody here knows the answer. None are significant at an FDR of 0.05. None. Some say none. OK. You just told me like half or three quarters of you have done multiple hypothesis correction testing, but you don't know <laughs> whether these p-values are significant at 0.05. It's a very complicated calculation, right? Sorry? Divide by 10. Multiply by 10, OK. Um, 0.006 times 10 is 0.06. Um, no. Nothing. No, well, let's check how we do this. I don't see any paper. Nobody's even working on my exercises. <laughs> this is very disappointing. All right, let's, let's pull out R. You know, this is how you do it, right? You just use R. <laughs> OK. No, but I'm not going to do it for you now. I'm just going to show you how to do it. Here's how you do it. You, we're going to create the, there are our p values. You know what? That's wrong. I should call them p. OK. And now we're going to sort them. All right, there they are. Now, the way you do the benny hochberg correction is you start with the last p-value, the highest one. And you ask yourself, you have 10 p-values, so you divide 10 by 10. Who can do 10 by 10? Somebody can do 10 by 10. That's one, OK? <laughs> and you ask, is 0.05 bigger than one, or less than one, or equal to one? It's bigger, so this is not significant, OK? It's really pretty easy. Take your next p-value, and you go 0.047. Is that bigger than or equal to 9 tenths times 0.05? Is it? No, it's not so hard. 0.05 times 9 tenths. 0.05 is times, point, times 9 tenths is 0.045. So this is not significant. It's just over the significant number. No good. But 0.05 times 8 tenths is exactly 0.04. So this hits the mark. So all of these are significant. That's how Benjamin Hochberg works. Okay? So eight out of the 10 are significant. All right. We're not doing so well. <laughs> this was problem one. I have like six exercises with multiple parts. I mean, it's going to be a long afternoon. All right, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how this goes. All right. Let's go back here. All right. Extra credit. I don't, yeah. What are the Q values? Um, anybody know how to compute a Q value here? Because that's what comes out of all differential analysis. You know how to do it? Yeah. So sh that's right, except that actually it turns out that um, if you've used R to get Q values, and this is the first sort of pro tip I'm giving you today, there's actually different functions. P dot adjust as an adjustment. It's by um, Gordon Smith wrote this many years ago. Then there was a paper by John Story, and there's actually different ways to produce Q values. They're subtly different, and what you said is one of them. So you should, uh, so anyway, I'll leave that for extra credit. If you had time to write out the P values in your board, you can do this during the rest of the talk, but there are other homework problems. Um, extra, extra credit, if you want to apply it in my group, is actually prove the benjamini hochberg theorem, which says that if the P values are independent, this procedure controls the false discovery rate which means that you can be guaranteed that um, among these eight p values that correspond to eight hypotheses, you will have at most 5% of the, 
of them be false discoveries. And that's really important to understand when you're doing analysis because we're testing many genes. We usually have 20,000 or 100,000 transcripts. And FDR, which is what the vast majority of methods output, only guarantee you that among this list, you have at most 5% false positives. But they don't guarantee anything about any member of that list. That's a subtle but important distinction. All right, so maybe we learned something. Here's the procedure. It's on Wikipedia. But you couldn't look that up because you're not allowed to use laptops. So it's great. OK. All right. That's very simple. So stepping back a second, the way you get a p-value is you just ran a test. And there's lots of different methods, and they run different tests. And I decided, in the interest of time, that I'm not going to talk about the different tests uh, because there's, you know, there's nothing particular to count analysis for you know, sequencing assays in genomics um, that's pertinent to these tests. It's a matter of basic statistics to understand which test is useful when and why one method uses one versus the other. All right, but here comes a really important lesson that's really, truly basic, but that most people, uh, I find, um, don't really, have never really thought through on their own. And the question is this. So basically, you did two conditions. And you, know, you did some replicates here and some replicates here. Your null hypothesis is going to be that the two conditions are the same. And so the way you're going to test that is you're going to compute the mean, uh, which is the average of your counts or whatever you're measuring. And you're going to compute a variance. Okay? And you're going to ask, you know, do the numbers in these conditions, you know, do they look very different? relative to the variance we're seeing. You know, if you have two conditions, if the variance is small, but the means are far apart, then you know, they're really different. Okay? It's very basic. But here's the thing. All the differential expression tools for counts, like you've probably heard of DSeq. Who's heard of DSeq? Yeah, basically like half the room. DSeq2, Edge R, like all these tools, they spe they're, they're really special. They have introduced new statistics and new methodology for genomics to examine variance. And the reason is, got to do with your next exercise, which is, what is the variance of the estimator? Okay, and that's, it's something that like, people in genomics have thought about a lot and dealt with a lot, where usually it's not an issue for people. Um, so here's the thing. So if you compute a mean, what does it mean to ask this question? You know, you have some numbers, and you compute their average. What does it mean to speak of the variance of the estimator? Well, what that means is you're going to say, well, let's suppose my numbers were, say, normally distributed. Actually, you don't even need to assume that. But let's say you assume they're normally distributed with some actual true mean. Um, you know, when you just draw n numbers at a time from this normal distribution, you're going to get different averages computed. And what will be the variance on those averages? Anybody know off the top of the head what the variance of the mean is? Yeah, exactly. Um, 1 over n, because the square root is the standard deviation. That's correct, though, yeah. So it's the variance of that normal random variable uh, divided by n. Now, the variance is not something you can control. You're looking at data that comes from some experiment where things are normal by some distribution. But n is your number of replicates. And the more replicates you have, the less variance you have on the mean estimator. So who knows the variance of the variance estimator? Anybody? Roughly? For normal, let's make it easy for normal random variables. The variance on the variance estimator. Wow. It's after lunch. I know the microbiome has taken all the power out of your brains. It's a microbiome. We're blaming it on the microbiome. OK. So I'll tell you the answer. I'm being too nice. I'm giving you the answers to the homework. But the, the, the variance in the variance estimator goes like the variance squared divided by roughly n. OK, so what that means is that to get a reasonable estimate of the variance of n numbers, you need to have a lot more replicates than to get the mean. It's a lot harder to guess the variance. Actually, since none of you did your work, let me, uh, um, let me show you. Oh, no, OK, so first, we're, so we're going to generate random numbers now. You should never, ever generate random numbers in R before you set the seed, OK? Because otherwise, it's not reproducible. This is my favorite seed. OK. 
I hope you can see this in the back, 42. So I'm going to generate some numbers and calculate the variance. So in R, you generate numbers with norm. Now, I'm going to generate six numbers, and I'll show you why in a second. I'm going to give them a mean of, we uh, can do whatever we want. Let's do 100. You always use 42? Sorry? You always use 42. I like 42, but. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, yeah, but it's OK because I don't write the software that my group produces. So I only, it's only my tutorials. And the great thing about using the same seed is I already know that the numbers will come out like I want because <laughs> I try different seeds. OK. Um, so I'm going to produce numbers with a mean of 100 and a variance of 100. Uh, 10 is, um, oh, I should actually tell R, this is the mean. We'll make this be the standard deviation. That's because, I'll explain why I did that in a second. So we're going to generate random numbers from a normal distribution. And we're going to get six of them. And let's look at their, let's first do their mean. Um, so we should get 100, right? I mean, that's what we should get. We won't get 100 because the numbers are random. We got 103.5007. We got. Um, 111, 93, 96. You know, it's pretty close, 100.6. It's not exact every time, but it's pretty close to 100. You can see all the numbers coming up there, OK? All right. Let's try the variance. I'm going to, instead of the mean, calculate the variance. OK, I should get 100. That's what the actual variance is. My first guess is 43. I mean, with the mean, I always was within a couple of numbers out of 100, like 95, 103. Let's look at a couple more. 104, that one's pretty good. But 135, 233. If you just did an experiment and you did, you know, three replicates in each of your two conditions, not many replicates, your variance is off by more than a factor of two. So something might actually be significant, but you don't think so because you didn't get the right estimate. So the, it's very hard to estimate the variance. That's what's hard about doing count data in genomics. And here's why. So let's think a bit about replicates, all right? You want to just get a lot of replicates so you can get your variance. Now, most biologists, their intuition is not to collect a lot of replicates. And I'll tell you why in a second. A lot of papers, actually amazingly, on our email list for our software program today, I'll tell you about it in a minute, somebody just today asked, why our program isn't working with, without replicates in their experiment, OK? Um, and the reason is that we didn't do what this program did, which is create a mode um, for working without replicates. There's actually a program, DSeq. You can have done an experiment where you did one thing in one condition and one in another, and it'll tell you what's significantly different. OK. No! Don't ever do that, OK? Please. You can't compute a variance with one experiment. Now, I'm being a bit rude. What they actually do in this method is they say, OK, let's pretend that most things in my experiment are not different. So I did two experiments, so they're replicates of each other. So n equals 2. Don't ever do experiments with n equals 2 either, OK? So, so not a good idea. So there was a paper a little while ago. Um, by a group that actually did a lot of simulations and experiments. They did 48 replicates to actually answer the question, how many replicates should you do? And everybody asks me this question always. And they decided that you should do at least six biological replicates in each of your conditions. Uh, but sometimes you need to do 12, especially if you want to identify splicing changes. This is a great idea, but only try this with other people's money, OK? The thing is, I, I uh, used to be just sort of a math person on the you know, writing theory and stuff, but now I have a little lab. And it's just like insane, the idea that somebody would do 12 replicates, OK? Because you, really, it's not just money. It's very expensive to do experiments. It takes a lot of time. It's not feasible. So what's happened is that most labs these days do three replicates. Some do two. I found, as a general rule, NSF-funded projects, you get two replicates. NIH, you get three, as a general rule. Um, but n is equal to three. And that's why I showed you the example with six, because you're going to have three replicates and another three replicates. And you're going to you together estimate the variance for that gene across your experiment. 
So usually you get n equals 6. And it's a very small number to estimate a variance. So how do you deal with the fact that you can't estimate variance? So what these methods do is they make parametric assumptions about the distributions of counts. And the reason for that is, I'll show you in a second, they basically make a plot where they look at the relationship between the mean and the variance. And they, this relationship is learned so that when you're looking at a gene, instead of just using the six numbers to get a variance estimate, you also borrow some information from genes that have similar abundance. Now, this is kind of cheating because there's no particular reason to think that a gene, even though it has similar abundance, should have similar variance on its abundance. It, maybe the gene behaves differently. But on average, as an average smoothing process, this has been shown in many papers now to sort of work, and this is called shrinkage. And the picture you should keep in your mind, so here is counts, the mean of the counts across your six samples, three plus three, and here is the sample variance. So you see it's quite noisy, okay? Like, um, you know, the, the, here even you have a similar number of counts, you get wildly different estimates for variance. Now, the simplest model, and that's gonna be the next slide, is the Poisson model, um, or multinomial model for counts. And if really your data just behaved according to the simplest model, you would get the relationship of this green line. But one of the things about biological data is there's what's called overdispersion. There's more variance than that. What people do is they learn this red line and all the different methods for DC, there's like 100 tools. Many of them, at least half, I'm not just making that number up, the difference is in how they estimate this red line. Okay, there's different tricks to estimate the red line. But they figure out a red line. And then instead of taking this point and looking at the mean, the mean is pretty accurate, and using this variance, you drop down to the x-axis, and you look, okay, that's my mean, and then you go up to the red line and you use that for your variance. So it's called shrinkage because, you know, all these points, the variance you use shrinks to the red line. And some methods don't shrink all the way to the red line, like they'll go halfway or by some rule, okay? But that's basically the majority of all the effort in differential expression for counts has been on how to shrink, because you have to shrink. If you don't shrink, you get like basically random numbers, okay? So it's important in order to understand shrinkage and to develop these methods to understand what distributions make sense for the red line, what exactly is the green line. And there are basically five or six exercises that you should do if you haven't done them then uh, this afternoon's a good time. I mean, you could go bike riding, you could go surfing, or you could do my homework, your, your call. Um, and these are the five exercises, and they would show up in you know, a freshman uh, probability or stats course, okay? Very elementary exercises. But they're crucial to getting the big picture here. And I don't have time, I don't think today, to you know, go through all of these little exercises. But the first one is, is you know, wh why is the multinomial distribution good for count data? And what is the multinomial distribution? And if you have paper out, you could actually do these exercises before I finish the slide. They're not hard, but you know. Second is, if you read these papers, and I urge you to actually read the papers that you're reading, um, people often say Poisson counts instead of multinomial counts. And actually the reason for that is that um, if you condition, uh, uh, the a Poisson random variable on, uh, uh, if, you, if you have n Poisson random variables, I should say it like this, and you condition on their sum, and you look at, you know, what's the distribution on one of them given the sum of all of them, then those distributions are multinomial. And so uh, these are very related. Basically, when you do these analyses, you, these are sort of interchangeable. Um, and that's this exercise. Um, but people prefer for count data something called the negative binomial distribution. And you know, one of the questions I would ask if this was a qualifying exam of all of you together is why is it called the negative binomial? Okay, it's a good question. If you don't know how to answer that question, then you don't know what the negative binomial distribution is. Okay. But more importantly for count data is exercise 3E, which is to show that the negative binomial is a mixture of Poisson, uh, Poisson distributions where there is a gamma distribution on the Poisson rate parameter. And that's sort of the right way 
to think about this. And that's sort of why the negative binomial actually makes sense for this kind of count data in genomics. So I decided for this tutorial, you know, I can't explain all of this in my tutorial right now, but I think I can at least leave you with these exercises. And this will is unfortunately videotaped, so you're going to be able to go back and do this. Okay. But if you follow these five exercises, then you'll understand this picture much better, and you'll know what the green line is and why the red line is something like a negative binomial and why you can think about it like mixing together different green lines. Okay, and that's sort of the message here. All right. Okay, this is a slight detour, but I, I was a tutorial, so I'm not even research talk. I wanted to give you a pro tip because this is a mistake that's made in so many papers that I cry when I read almost every paper these days, okay? People like to take counts and log them. Now, that's actually not a crazy thing to do because logarithm is sort of what's called a stabilizing transformation. And often, it's pretty true and close to true that the logarithm of counts tend to look sort of normally distributed, okay? Some people think this is a bad idea, but it's actually okay to do, and you know, there, there's reasons why you might work with a negative binomial, but for some models, it's very convenient to, to work with normal random variables. And so logging your counts is a good thing to do, okay? You can do it. But some people log abundances which are reported in different units. Now, I'm gonna tell you what these are in a second, called FPKM and RPKM, and that's not okay to do, okay? I'd say these days, like half to three quarters of papers I read, like they actually do this, all right? That's like a terrible, terrible idea. So I think it's a bad idea in your exercises to figure out why, okay? <laughs> so, all right, I'm gonna give you a clue. All right, uh, I guess I should write here. Can you, I don't know if you can all read. Can you read this? Log? It says log. All right. All right. Who knows what log A divided by B is? Log A minus log B. Thank you. Yes. Log A minus log B. OK? Now let me tell you what these units are. So FPKM is a unit you assign to a gene or a transcript that you've measured the abundance of. You, like, it's a little bit got some constants, but it's basically you take the number of counts, I'll write C, that you got for your gene. But instead of just reporting the counts, you divide, let's say this is a transcript actually, you divide by its length, I'll write L. The reason you do that is in an RNA-seq experiment or other kinds of experiments where you fragment your molecules, the longer your transcript is, the more counts you expect, just because it's long. Okay, not because it's more abundant, all right? because you just have more of a chance to sample it. So this normalizes for that. And then you might also normalize for the total number of reads you actually sequence, because if you sequence a million reads, you're going to have half as many counts on this tr transcript than if you sequence two million reads, basically obvious. This is what this unit is. It's fragments per kilobase of transcript. That's the division by L. You know, let me write capital L. It's a bit clear. And then, you know, millions of reads sequenced, so that's capital T. And there's like a factor of a million and a thousand in here, but that doesn't matter. So if you take the log of this, then you should ask yourself what's going to happen, okay? So you're going to get the log counts. I can't help myself. I'm doing your homework for you again. You're going to get the log counts minus the log of the total number of reads, and that's fine because that's the same, okay, for every transcript, but the length is not the same. So you, you know, it gets like distorted, all right? So you don't want to do that. So if you learned one thing in today's tutorial, that's it. Don't log these units, log your counts, okay, but not these units. All right. So how to count? So I've talked about counts, but like I'm going back in some time now. So we had p values, you know, they came from a test. That test statistic used the mean and variance, but actually there were counts. Counts of what, okay? And actually, that turns out to be a sort of complicated question. Um, not complicated, but requires like a, a tutorial, so. Um, <laughs> all right, so I need to tell you about the difference between counts and abundances. But I just did, it's actually very simple, but here I just wanted to put in a bit of math, so that you could uh, math you know, symbols, so you could like, 
be, uh, be precise, they told me. OK, so when you're doing an experiment, I told you, you know, there's the reads that align to your transcript. And you count them. And these units alpha, they're sort of like the counts, just normalized by the total so that they sum up to 1. OK? But these abundances rho, which also sum up to 1, they're the abundance of the whole transcript where you've taken your counts and you've divided by the length. And the reason you did that is because as an object, your transcript um, you know, produces more counts and more reads the longer it is. Okay? So because of that, you divide by length. And this is just the normalization so that things are scaling so that things add up to 1. This confuses people, confuses me, because there are two pie charts. There's the pie chart of how many reads do you see for each transcript? Here in my experiment, there are just three. And there's the pie chart of how abundant each transcript is. And I try to use those two words carefully. Is that clear? Pretty basic, OK? You can go back and forth. If you have the rows, you get the alphas by multiplying them by the length and, or, and scaling. If you have the rows, you can get the alphas by going in reverse. Or, or uh, maybe, uh, OK. I think I said the same thing twice, but you get the idea. Uh, yeah. All right. So here's a very obvious fact. Again, if you have your paper out, and I, I mean, you guys think you should actually just write this one line. You know, if you had, um, like, let's say you did two experiments. So, you know, you got a count abundance for the transcript T in one experiment and then in the second. Then, you know, the, the ratio between these two is the same as the ratio between these two. Like, why is that? Well, this is just. Rho is just alpha times L. Um, uh, sorry, alpha divided by L. This is alpha divided by L. This is another alpha, namely this one, divided by the same L. The length, this is one, one single transcript. It's got the same length. Those lengths cancel. OK? So it's very simple. Okay? It's very, very elementary. So this is kind of nice, actually. The alphas and the rows are different, but relatively, for a transcript, they're the same. And that's really nice because it means that you can work just with your counts rather than like dividing by lengths and all that stuff. Right? So it's just slightly more convenient. All right, but here comes the problem um, with counting and why there's a whole section in the tutorial on counting is let's say you want the counts for a whole gene. So my gene is made up of three different transcripts. Okay? It's red, green, and blue. So I mean, if I have R number of counts for red, G for green, and B for blue. I just add up the counts. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, nobody's going to argue with that. And also, the abundance of the gene, uh, I just sum the abundances. Is that everybody agree? I mean, it's very simple, OK? But while it's true that for the, each individual transcript, these ratios are the same, it's not going to be necessarily true. In fact, it will almost always not be true that the ratio between the gene counts is the same. I mean, uh, OK, here's why. <laughs> All right. So if you take uh, you know, a, a third divided by two thirds is a half. I mean, that's OK. But when you add fractions, you can't just like add the denominators. Okay? So, you know. And it's not funny. You know how many people have done this in their papers? And like science, cell, nature, all these things? I mean, it's not funny, really. <laughs> It's kind of like you want to do 1 plus 2 cubed. You get 1 cubed plus 2 cubed, you know. Um, I hope, yeah, that's not correct. OK. All right. That's kind of the error. All right, that's exactly the error. Sometimes it is correct, actually. All right. If the lengths are the same, you know, if these denominators were both 3, then this actual, uh, this is, you know, your toddler's arithmetic works out sometimes. And it's really frustrating, because they come and say, Daddy, it worked out, you know. Like, why is this not OK? But it's not OK. It works out sometimes. Kind of like this can also actually be true, you know, sometimes. But it's not usually true. OK. So this actually is a fundamental problem. And we wrote a paper. Um, this is Cole Trapnell. He's now at UW, my former student and uh, a developer of cufflinks, which some of you may have used. We wrote this paper on cufflinks. And we wrote a little thought experiment down, which illustrated that this is sort of a serious issue in that you can actually, if you're calculating log full change at the gene level by summing the counts of the individual transcripts, you can get 
an overestimate, an underestimate, like everything can go wrong, okay? I think, you know, in arbitrary ways. So we wrote a paper on this, and we like tried to fix this issue in cufflinks by not computing gene counts as the sum of the constituent transcript counts. Um, and we did an experiment, actually. Uh, this was um, Cole and his collaborator at the Broad Institute at the time from the RIN lab. Uh, this is in some experiment they were doing. They calculated microarray fold changes versus RNA-seq fold changes. And we, uh, you can't really see this, but basically, there is much better agreement if you count the right way. So counting the naive way actually gives more difference. So we wrote this in a paper, and in the cufflink software, we try to make a point that you shouldn't just add up counts. And we got a little frustrated because a lot of people didn't want to listen to us. But four years later, um, some of the uh, like competing groups uh, wrote a paper and uh, introduced a tool that actually gets the counts for the gene uh, by first estimating counts of transcripts and then adding up the abundances of the transcripts rather than just the raw counts. And they didn't cite us, so I'm a little bitter. And they got the dates wrong on their own paper. I mean, whatever, they're clueless. I can tell you they're clueless because it's actually an unsolved problem how to do this. I'm going to explain this problem to you. So, so this is the more interesting exercise for the afternoon because I don't you know, really know the exact right answer for this. Here's the issue. You can add up the rows, the abundances of transcripts, by first trying to estimate how many individual reads you had on each transcript, dividing by the lengths, adding up those abundances to get the abundance for the whole gene. And that's legitimate. Okay? But for all these differential count methods, you don't need an abundance, which is a fraction from 0 to 1. You need a count. So how do you go from the abundance of a gene to the number of counts that that gene produced? Well, you need to know the length. Remember, alpha was rho times the length. So what's the length of a gene? If you have three isoforms and they have different lengths, how do you get a length for the gene? And it's actually not obvious. You could take the average of the lengths. You could take their median. They made some arbitrary choice here. But there is no current really statistically motivated, reasonable argument for what you should do. So if you want to play with that and think about it, that's a good exercise. All right. I'm getting near to my um, 45 minutes. So that's how you count. All right. But now you need to actually get the counts. And I'm lucky here because I gave a little research talk on Monday on how to do that. So I'm not going to talk about that. But I think you should use our software, but you don't have to. Um, uh, but anyway, you need to count somehow. All right. So I've reviewed like the overall methodological challenges. So the question is, you know, which program should you use? All right. Which method? Now, I'm grading your homework, so you should use my program. OK. It's really easy. <laughs> OK. Um, so we wrote a paper that was published this year. And I'm quite proud of this paper because we really tried to look at all these issues and you know, come up with a novel method that sort of addressed the fundamental issues, specifically dealing with the fact that there is variance in estimating the counts for one single isoform, which I just told you you have to do, even if you want to do gene-level differential expression. Um, uh, so how did we do it? Um, I'm going to tell you very briefly. Uh, there's like three slides with math. I'm going to go through them very quickly and then just show you the results. So the way we did it is we adopted the, the simplest model you could use for this problem. That's not our idea. Many, many different methods use this model, where you log the counts, and you say they're sort of normal, and you write a linear model like this. Um, you have a parameter here which is going to represent your biological variance that you're going to estimate by doing this kind of shrinkage that I showed you before. So usually, in these kind of models, you take your counts, and you, you, know, you estimate these parameters. And you might do something like a likelihood ratio test, where first, you'd estimate a full model where you have a parameter for the condition, and then you estimate a null model where you assume there is no condition. Everything's the same, and you, you do some test. But um, what we wanted to do is say, you know, this variable, we don't actually know it. Because when we get the counts, 
we get coming out of Callista pseudo alignment, or any, frankly, any alignment, we get ambiguity in the reads. And so we cannot actually get these counts. So what do you do? So we simply did a very simple thing. You extend this model where you say, oh, okay, I cannot measure the Ys. I can measure what we call D in our, you know, in our, in our paper, where this is the actual measurement that comes out of something like Callisto. And there's some variance on that estimate because we ran some algorithm like the EM algorithm to get it. And we have a handle on this because we can do the bootstrap. Remember I told you on Monday how important that is? That's why it's important because we can, we can estimate this, we can measure this, and so we really, this is what's linear. Um, and so then we can kind of put it all together and do differential expression. And we did the same thing that others do, this kind of shrinkage. So this is high level, but that's kind of what we did. Um, and I won't go through this math, but this says you know, how we estimated things and so forth and so on. Good. So this is the result. And I'm going to show you just two figures that are from our paper. This is our figure two, A and B. This is a benchmark that we did on, um, uh, with various different programs in a simulation that we really worked uh, very hard to perform fairly. What we did is we actually adopted the model of DSeq or DSeq2. They're very similar, these two programs. They have a model where the counts for each transcript are negative binomial. Our model doesn't know anything about the negative binomial, but we wanted to use their model to make the point that these results are not just that we simulated from our model. We're simulating from a totally different model. Um, we learned parameters for the simulation I'm not telling you about by taking real data sets uh, with three replicates in two conditions and carefully learning what the differences look like in the real data. We simulated reads, you know, uh, and not counts. And by the way, this is all sort of available for you to use. If you want to play with this, you can run these simulations easily on your own. Um, we benchmarked various methods. And the x-axis here is the false discovery rate. So remember, a method outputs Q values for each transcript, in this case, for each gene. You rank them. And as you go down your list, this is the false discovery rate. And this is the sensitivity, because this being a simulation, we know the ground truth. I think this is one of the most interesting curves. This is what you get if you just rank your genes by log fold change. You know, you take your counts in condition A, condition B. You yeah, calculate an average here and here, and you take the, the log fold change. Amazingly, people still do this. I don't know why, because it is a very, very bad method. All this research that people have been doing over the years actually does something for you. It's not like a waste of time. And the difference is enormous. You know, this method doesn't even get to a reasonable false discovery rate. This is our method sleuth in black here. And even at the gene level, it's beating all these different methods. So um, this is uh, the same plot where you look at the isoform level. And many people have said, you know, you cannot test differential expression of isoforms. In fact, that paper I just showed you said you need 12 replicates. Here we had three. And there's something to that. If you're paying attention, you'll see the sensitivities here are very low. OK, they're lower. But that's OK, because what matters when you look for transcripts that are differential is not that to try to find all of them. That's very hard. But you can control your false discovery rate. If I look over here, I can find you 200 isoforms of genes that are differential with only 5% of them being false. And that's useful, because you can go and study them. Okay? Actually. These little triangles and squares are interesting. The, the false discovery rate on the x-axis is the true false discovery rate, because we know the truth. But this is where the program thinks that uh, triangle is, I think, 0.01, and circle is 0.05, and square is 0.1. That's where each program thinks its FDR is. So for example, um, uh, actually, I think it goes, yeah, triangle. Um, yeah, I can't even see. I've forgotten if it's triangle, circle, square, or the other way around. But um, I think you can see here that programs are wildly off. Like this log fold change, uh, or you know, even these programs here, like they're telling you your false discovery rate is 0.05, but it's actually something else. So on that metric, it's good to be conservative. OK, so 
The message here is that it really pays off to use those bootstraps to be able to assess the variance in your abundance estimate. Um, okay, you may now turn on your cell phones and laptops. I think I'm done uh, taking questions. Thank you.